Next thing we're going to do is um, read a letter from Joe Shane Carlin. He is Ezra's father. He testified in the trial. And to, in order to save my voice, Judge, I have asked Mr. Nelson if he could please read it for me. Again, this is a letter from uh, Joe Shane Carlin. Ladies and gentlemen, I've worked in corrections for 20 plus years now and I've seen and dealt with people you never want to meet on the street or any other walk of life. These people are cold, violent, and sometimes brutal. No matter what picture Ms. Nodolf has painted for you, Ezra is not one of these. She is not like any of these people. In fact, hundreds of people could tell you that she's just the opposite. She loves to a fault and sees the good in everyone she meets. When I say that she loves to a fault, I mean that literally is in that she trusts people even though she's vulnerable to even those she's vulnerable to without even knowing she's being used, abused, or mistreated. She sometimes stays in relationships longer than she should, and at some point things reach the tipping point. Another thing to note is that in these 20 plus years in corrections, I've worked side by side with offenders in my custody. Some of these people have been in prison longer than they were alive before getting locked up. Many have matured greatly. Some, unfortunately, have not. Ezra has never once denied she did this or said, I didn't do it. In fact, she accepted her role in this all and has faced it all head on while enduring comments on her character. One common denominator in all those that I've worked with over the years is that no matter how long you keep them incarcerated, you can't teach those any more in 20 years than you can in five or 10. All you do after five or 10 years is turn a person bitter, angry, and never wanting to change for the better or strive for success. Ezra is bearing the burden of the horrific memories of that day, and she will continue to do so each and every day of her life. She will bear that burden on every single birthday, Christmas, holidays, family events, and every waking moment she's away, we, her family, bear it too. Sentencing a young person like this to life without parole is not only a mistake, but a huge loss for everyone who loves her. By offering Ezra an eligibility date, you offer her a chance to be a productive contributor to society which ultimately is our goal in the Department of Corrections. Don't just make her, don't make her just a name and number tag on a door for the rest of her life. Remember, she is a beautiful human being that is loved by many and give her another opportunity at this chaotic ride we all call life. Please give her a, the chance, a chance to benefit all of us who love her and to let her come home to be a big sister daughter, niece, granddaughter, that we all want and need in our lives because with her we are all blessed. To all of you here today in support of Alex, I am so sorry to all of you who've lost your son, grandson, nephew, or friend. I want you all to know that a great many nights I've prayed for you all and wish that I could shake your hand or hug you and tell you that I'm sorry for your loss. Know that all of you that I really am sorry for your loss. Today and every day, I pray that you somehow find peace. I also pray that you find a way to find forgiveness. I'm not asking you to forget Alex by any means, but I'm asking you to find a way to find some peace. You deserve peace. Although my family hasn't experienced the same loss you have, we too are experiencing a huge loss in all of this. Ezra has parents like myself, family, siblings, and many friends that really want to see her come home someday. May you all find peace, and I sincerely hope the court hears my words and takes them into consideration upon making the decision about Ezra's sentence today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, Debbie Carlin, who is Ezra McCandless's grandmother and Joe Shane's mother, wanted to address the court. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm Ezra's grandmother. And this dear child came into my life when she was four years old. She asked me to be her grandma, but I was already in love with her by then. You, Alex's family, have loved Alex with all your heart and have made beautiful memories. And I love my Ezra with all my heart, with all my being. And I've made some beautiful memories. This child who the court has addressed as a mean, vicious person, this child in second grade saved some birds in a nest, put them in her pocket because the nest had fallen on the ground and they took, she took them to school in her pocket. I got a call from school. The teacher said, we've got baby birds in the, in the pocket. And Ezra had all her friends gathering worms at recess so she could feed those baby birds. Then my dear granddaughter rescued a poor, starving, stinky billy goat from a farmer. She rescued that stinky old animal on the verge of death. She brought him home as a pet and groomed him. And she'd give him baths and led him around. And then she'd come and give me a hug and she'd stink just like that billy goat. But she thought it was the best thing in the world because she saved him. On the playground, there was never a child left behind when Ezra was there. Never. She always made friends. And if she seen somebody alone, Guess who she went to sit with at lunch? That child sitting alone. This beautiful child always thought of everybody else before herself. And she became a young lady. And she could never see wrong in anyone. Anyone. She always found good the children at school, the kids that were picked on. She found good in all of them. And she sat with them, walked through the halls with them. As a young lady, she loved unconditionally. She loved everybody. Absolutely everybody. She could never say anything bad. And I just want you to know, that is the Ezra. That is my granddaughter. She loves life. And I love her. Thank you. I've been told that... Um... Ezra McCandless, perhaps the most emotional we have seen her yet with her grandmother's heartfelt testimony. We're going to hit the pause button, so to speak, on this case. You won't miss a thing. We have to step aside, take a break before the top of the hour. When we come back, we'll get you back into the courtroom in Wisconsin and get you a live update from New York City on Harvey Weinstein's rape trial.